At the makerspace where I work, some young people have come in and started 3D printing full suits of armor, cosplay armor, with helmets that you can fit over your head. Now, this is not the first time that I have seen or heard of people making 3D printed helmets, and it's kind of been in the back of my mind to do a similar project to this, but I've always had this idea of doing it that I thought would be better than the traditional technique. And when the JG Maker Artist D Pro came into my hands, I thought, you know, maybe it's time that I explore this idea. So before we talk about how I 3D printed this helmet and the technique that I used to do it, let's talk about this 3D printer first. Editing room Joe jumping in here because oh yeah, I let myself ramble. So let me just cut to the chase here. The JG Maker Artist D Pro. On the good side, it is a large format IDEX 3D printer at a value price. That means you're getting a lot of capability for comparatively not a lot of money. It, it, it really is a great value. And because this is the Pro, it's got the improved user interface, which is a vastly better experience than the non-pro version and and i love that about this printer also i have to give super props to the assembly process they've got those stickers on every cable and where they go so it's super easy to put this thing together however when you have this much printer for a low price you're going to have things that uh, aren't quite perfect and in this case it's the bed level with the pre-Kickstarter one, they had set it up as a five-point leveling system, and sure enough, that fifth point is still sitting in the middle. And I tried, I really, really tried to adjust the lead screw and get it leveled and test it out, but I just couldn't make it work. The proper way to level a bed, in my opinion, is to let the 3D print tell you where the level is good or not. Do a 3D print that's pushed out to the sides and adjust your level live so that you can see how the plastic is going to stick and you cannot do that with the five point leveling process in the end i just had to remove the magnetic plate cut into the magnet and remove that center peg and as soon as i did that i was getting much much better prints but not perfect because at that time i also discovered that this particular 3d printer that they sent to me was broken on arrival the wheels underneath the y-axis were just stripped out and i i can't figure out what's going on here my best guess is that this was a return and they were like well hey let's just send this to joe maybe he'll be able to fix it and i'm not sure that that's the best way to handle customer support but i am grateful to have this 3d printer and hey guys if you need somebody to you know repair and have a free 3d printer i'll take another one i don't mind just you know it's weird that they would send that to a reviewer also there's the slicer cura is not ready for idex open source has not figured out what we need to do for idex and so all these people making it are kind of on their own and flash print has solved it by having a proprietary slicer that they can control everything on and that works great for them we do solve this by having a proprietary slicer that is incredibly difficult to use, but hey, you can use Cura. And JG Maker has solved it by giving you 3MF files that you can import into Cura, and Cura will set up your print for it. Which is fine, it works great, until you need to change the material. If you want to go from PLA to PETG, you have to load up a whole new 3MF profile. You can't change it in Cura or Cura freaks out and it's like, wait, all of these specific settings that are made to make your printer go better, do you want me to change them too? I feel like Cura and open source is not ready for IDEX yet and I'm almost afraid that we're not gonna get it sorted out before IDEX becomes irrelevant in place of tool changers. Also, calibrating dual nozzles so that they are properly lined up with each other is a special form of insanity and it just takes me honestly a whole day of repeating prints and repeating prints and repeating prints to get that to work 
Nevertheless, once I got through the woods, once I got this machine set up and making prints, it's kind of become my workhorse machine. I keep going back to this machine to do dual prints and multi-material prints and large format prints. And so in the end, despite all the insanity, like the X40, I can say it works, but more than the X40, this one's actually really good. And because it's large format, I wanted to use it to print some big prints like uh, this project, which I bring out to show you that it was printing this beautiful and clean and nice lines. There's no wiggle or anything in this, but I don't want to talk about this project right now. We'll say this for a future video, but we can talk about the helmet that I was working on. So let's talk about what makes this helmet model different than the way that other people do helmet models. If you've ever seen anybody 3D print a helmet before, they probably accomplished it in one of two ways. Option number one, if you don't have a large format 3D printer, you print it in smaller chunks. And then you take those chunks and you glue them all together and you put it on your noggin. Option two, if you have a large format 3D printer, you print it all in one go. But that technique usually requires a lot of supports and it tends to be heavy especially if it's a model that you've downloaded online they usually make the walls of those models fairly thick partially because it's difficult to model the inside of the outside of something you have a lot of well we got to simplify it for where the head goes and partially because well, you don't know how people are going to scale it. I mean, sure, you could make it for the biggest head possible, which would be my head. No, I'm not kidding. I have a huge cranium. No, check it out. It's not a trick banana. My head is just big. But if you make the walls too thin for my big head and then shrink it down, those walls might be way too thin. And so you've got to make the walls thin enough so that you can shrink it down or scale it up. And then when you scale it up, the walls are huge. There was a young man at the makerspace making a Mandalorian helmet. And this helmet took more than a week to print and more than a kilogram of filament. He removed the supports. He was still carrying around more than two pounds of plastic on his head. And I mean, that's not prohibitive, but what if there was a way that you could do it where the prints could be very, very light and you could scale it up and down for any size head. This is what I wanted to try doing. Now, if you're an old person like me, you might immediately recognize this helmet. It's from an old TV show called Battlestar Galactica. And these were the robot enemies that they fought every week. In the old Battlestar Galactica, a silen blew up in every episodes. Sure, it might have been the same footage that they used in last week's, but a Cylon was going to blow up every time, and that's what I loved about the show. Now, back in the day, these helmets were actually vacuum formed, which means that they were actually really thin plastic, very lightweight, and this 3D print is actually very thin and very lightweight as well, because the way that I did it is I didn't model this with the outside and the inside. I just modeled the outside of the model and i designed it so that the head would lay flat so i modeled just the outside and gave it a flat bottom and then when i brought it into the slicer i told it well it's basically vase mode okay uh as many shells as you feel you need and then i was experimenting with different shells i found four was okay but six is probably better no infill, no initial bottom layers so that your bottom is empty. You also want to increase the number of top layers. Because this is hollow and because this is so wide open, you can see here that, yeah, I needed more top layers on this print. This print right here was a fail on multiple levels, but it taught me a lot of things. It taught me that I need more top layers. It also taught me that I had my settings all wrong for printing PETG on this machine. Yeah, I'm not printing this in PLA, I'm printing it in PETG, but 
oh, it's just ugly. And the other thing that I learned was that you should do test prints that are smaller than the print that you want to do. As a consequence of that, I started making test prints and more test prints and more test prints. I have Amari Kashi dolls of Cylon helmets here. And that's okay. This is going to come in useful as I'm playing with different ways of finishing this. I have some smaller prints to test out my finishing techniques on. Test small. But the other thing that this taught me was that at this size, it is in fact big enough to fit over my huge caradium. Can't see a thing, but it fits. Now, one of the downsides of this technique, as you might have guessed, is that because it's one solid object, there is no eye holes or holes of any kind. And if you have a model that you need holes, oh, sorry, you're going to need holes somewhere, you're gonna to have to cut them out. I found the best way to cut them was a combination of using a soldering iron with a very flat and blade-like tip on it to do the initial cutting, and then a Dremel tool to do the smoothing of those rough edges. Now, of course, there is the question of supports, and I can't claim that this model didn't have any supports. These cheeks needed to be supported, and underneath the eyes, needed to have supports, lots of supports in there. And that's fine, but then there was also a problem. You can't see it here, but internally, where this eye slit came to a point, there was nothing underneath it, and those points were fails. But I couldn't do supports on the inside because that was the inside where the infill was supposed to hold it up, the infill that this did not print with. And so I came up with a technique of adding a kind of cylinder of a hole or a cube of a hole that went from those corners that needed support all the way to the build plate. So I essentially in the model just drilled a hole through it and that hole became something that it printed so that it got to that point and had something to support it. Now it wasn't perfect, but again, the outside is the only part that we want to be perfect. The inside can be a mess and we'll clean that up. Nobody will ever see it, at least not when it's on our head. Once I had figured it all out, did a few more test prints to make sure it would work, I went ahead and did the final print. Now I have done some work on this print, as you can tell. The LEDs are already inside it, as well as some cushion, and it's all driven by an Arduino powered by a nine volt battery. This thing will run forever, but I should mention, I did cut out the eye hole. So what are the LEDs sitting in? Well, I created a specific little mount that I could wire the LEDs up outside of this helmet so I wouldn't have to be working on the inside that would just slip over the inside of that. Also, as I was doing this, like I said, I only did four walls and I've run into so many problems. It, it just, it cracks and it doesn't have the pressure. And sometimes if the layers don't hold super well, then they split and delaminate. And I've had to constantly deal with that as I do this. But I think if I were doing this again, I might either put more shells on it, maybe up to six shells, or keep it thin. Two, maybe four shells, if you're confident in your 3D printer, you could go as low as two, and then use some two-part resin, pour it on the inside to create the support for it. Now, some people might wanna use resin on the outside, and that's a good way to go as well. It smooths out those layer lines, but these layer lines have all been smoothed by well, I used a little bit of Bondo because for some reason the plate wasn't super steady and the print ended up being a little bit wiggly, so I needed to smooth those out. And then the rest of it is just primer, sanding, more primer, more sanding, more primer, more sanding, more primer, more sanding. But the result is looking absolutely beautiful. And the last thing that I have to do is to figure out a way to give it that mirror shine that the Cylons on the TV show had that drove the cameramen on the TV show absolutely bonkers. Oh, and I can see out of it. In the TV show, they would actually put holes in the forehead and the actors would be able to look through those holes, but they kind of had to hold their head up and look through those holes and look at the ceiling. So as they're acting, if you go watch any old clips of that, think about the actors in these suits tipping their head up and walking around like this, because if they look down or if they look naturally, the head would be tilted down so the robots would all be looking at the floor. No, the actors had to tilt act 
with their heads tilted up. So that's kind of crazy. I don't have to do that because I put holes between the LEDs. Now that means I can't use a diffuser to make it so that you don't see the individual LEDs. In real life, that's kind of a problem, but on camera, I think it kind of works. And it fits perfectly. Now this technique will probably work for several different types of helmets, but will it work for all possible helmets? I, I don't know. I, I think that there are probably some helmets out there that would benefit from doing it the traditional way. But on the techniques where it can, this is extremely lightweight. Like surprisingly, you pick it up and you go, oh, there, there's practically nothing here. And yeah, it's extremely lightweight. I think that adding the nine volt battery just about doubled its weight. So there we go, a new technique for doing helmets that might be able to save time and that's scalable. Make this fit your head and because it's the slicer that's determining the wall thickness, you don't have to worry that your walls are getting too thin or that they're too thick and heavy. Every head is accommodated by this technique and I think that is really super exciting. By your command. While you're checking out this cool thing posted by one of you on the What You Making channel on my Discord, why don't you open up the cards and see what deep dive into the topics of this video you can do. And this is really cool. Yeah, I really enjoy it when people connect with me on social media. That's why I've got links to all the socials in the description and I hope you'll check them out. I've also got a Patreon which you can check out here and I'll tell you a little secret about the suggested videos. This is the one that YouTube thinks that you'll like. This is the one though that I think you'll like. Which one of us is right? Only one way to know for sure, gotta watch them both. And remember, safety first because I really do care about you and see you next time.